Sega Sega Greco, Makashin Gets, Kenekahaga Nugu Hunjara, Wakatu Huni. Welcome back to Onegano's Let's Talk Water. This is our eighth week, and this is our also our first week that we're not live. So we have picked a theme of women's connection to water, and our next speakers coming up are a bunch of highlights of our strong women, and that includes Erin Wise. Kwana Chasing Horse, Tina Nata, and Louise Bear, who's a Bear Clan mother from Six Nations. So if you missed any of the episodes that they were in, don't worry, they're coming up next. Enjoy! destroyed and sea levels will rise and more methane gas will be released into the air every year. because I wanted to, because I just came back from the United Nations um, climate change um, summit that Greta was at. And I just did the opening for the United Nations that day, not that day, but I just got back from there. And just seeing, being with the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, I seen all of these different youth from all over the world who basically are all saying the same exact thing that they um, that they were worried about their future um, and they were and including our youth here in Six Nations they're saying that they're worried about their future because we went to the schools and they said they're worried about our water health our health the health of our water bodies here in Six Nations like Mackenzie Creek like Boston Creek and um, and, and the Grand River because pe people don't want to 
like jump in it or go swimming in it and all the things that we should be doing or even fishing in the Grand River. People don't want to do that because it's unhealthy right now. And this the reality is, is that youth are really scared for their future, as you could see that they didn't want to, they're scared and they didn't want to produce any children in this new world that we're coming into that is not looking very help, hopeful. Um, so I wanted to start out the video with our Thanksgiving address, which um, kind of sets your mind to a place of giving thanks. And that's what all of our elders really tell us to do. And that's the giving thanks or the Thanksgiving address, the Hando Galiwadekwa is what we're supposed to do every single day to give thanks for everything that you see outside from the bugs, from the, from the dirt, from the, it, from the blade of grasses, um, crickets, and all the way up. Um, and that's like the plants, the medicines, the people. Um, and let's like look outside and everything that you see outside from like the winds um, and the moon and the sun um, and Sung Wai Biso, the creator. So we just like are supposed to give thanks and that's what sets your mind up. Um, your mind and sets your mind for the day, I guess. And then eventually like your life that you're giving thanks. And studies have backed that up and shown scientifically that if you're more thankful, then you're a happier person and you're um, you just have a happier person and it, and it rewires your brain to give thanks and be happy for that day. So and if there's any uh, traditional people watching, you will know that's the same way we sing Ostoa Goa because we start on the ground and we go all the way up to where in the heavens dancing with our ancestors because that's what they say is that when we have our ceremonies, they're having their ceremonies at the same exact time. So it just connects us and that's Another thing about music is it is a bridge to here to there, basically. It's the closest we can come to being in Gong Hyuke while we're still alive. Uh, for mm -hmm. all the people, you know, all the musicians and all the traditional people out there. That's what um, I've been taught anyways. That's just what I heard anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what mainly that video is about, like what we're supposed to be doing right now. And that's like just living our traditional way of life, basically like hunting, um, putting in a garden, practicing our traditional ceremonies or languages and being healthy and kind to one another and our relationships, no matter what those relationships are. Um, and I think we're gonna play another video that's called Women's Connection to Water. It's another digital story. With wine top. Yeah, these two girls right here are from six. Kind of, yeah, they're from Six Nations. Six Nations Gowanio. At the Gowanio School, yeah. Oh, and then that. <laughs> I'm so good. And that all means we give thanks to all the different levels of the water. It means we give thanks to the levels of water, the streams, the lakes, and the big oceans. I wanted to tell about my journey with water. This journey started when I was a little girl. It started with my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother all the way down to me. We have to keep up this relationship and look at our teachings for wisdom and remember where we come from. Through the rites of passages that I've been through, I've learned to uphold these responsibilities to the land and water that are also stated in a great law. Okay, you're asking me how important water is to the plants or the people. Well, I've had an experience with that 
what I had. Um, I was never afraid of work. When a, a week ago I had a bushel and a half of tomatoes to do and a bushel of cucumbers and Monday morning I collapsed I banged my head. To be dehydrated is a terrible feeling. You need that water in your system. When you perspire and you're working, you need water, but you also need the salt in your system. It is very important that we drink water and and the salt to be in our system. And uh, and I think this is very good with the, what is happening today with the, uh, uh, the work university is doing uh, with water and how important water is to us. Thank you. Skala, can I say it now, Gyaso? Hi, my name is Chelsea. I am a Cuga turtle from Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, I am a mother of a little boy named Dehano Hatrose. Um, and since I became a mother, my connection to water has changed. Our babies are carried in water for nine months, and that is what protects them and grows life. We need water to continue to continue the circle of life for our future generations to come. It's not like we feel angry at the government or anything because our people don't have this and that's the thing is, is like it's just reality living on reserve is that you grow up being treated unfairly it's not really something you I don't know like you really think twice about it's mm. just the way it is like, mm. and in my family like um, my in-laws they live without running water like a lot of us just it's just kind of the norm on reserve and I know I was talking to Dawn before and then I know she said that it's like said it to me like I talked about it in like a positive way but she says you know but it's not right and, and mm -hmm. I'm like yeah it's not right but it's kind of like you have to tell yourself every day that well this is just the way it is mm -hmm. otherwise you will feel angry a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, really bitter towards I guess the government or anybody who treats like people for mm -hmm. impact and know that this is happening even though you don't see it every day it's happening right underneath us and and we need to stand against it because it's wrong even under united nations it's illegal to take water out of our aquifer because it takes ten thousand years to replenish that water so it's a non-renewable source of water that we will never get back. And I want our future generations to never have to worry about whether they're going to have water or not. They shouldn't worry about their environment. We need to protect our environment and our water and our water that we cannot see, which is our aquifer underneath. We have to fight as hard as our grandparents and our ancestors did to protect our, our existence. So our future generations and our circle of life can continue in our ceremonies and what makes us who we are as Ongohoi people. Yeah.
Okay. All right. So that video was right after I went up to Nestle and I was like, I'm going to give you a decease and desist letter. And so the next summer we, um, we gave the seat, we gave Nestle a cease and desist letter on the behalf of, or coming from our Confederacy Council, our traditional Confederacy Council, which is our traditional um, government here in Six Nations. And um, I walked up to the Nestle people and they're all in their SUVs and everything looking scary on their property. And me and two other clan mothers and maybe three community members went up and handed it to them. And it basically, it's on YouTube if you wanna watch it. And our protest is also on Rotten, on, um, on, you, on, Netflix. on Netflix, yes, on Netflix. And um, yeah, um, which is a huge deal because then now Nestle is gone from Canada and Nestle, was, or I guess, I think it's called Spring Waters was going to take their place and continue to pump water from, continue to do what Nestle was doing was, which was taking 3.6 million liters out of our aquifer per day. Um, and I think it was $500 for per year, which they're making millions Billions. and billions of money off of our water source when our community doesn't even have clean drinking water. And so that's what made me um, mad and made me want to go do all of those things. And, and then so now Nestle is out and then that um, Crystal Water River or something, I can't really remember the name that was going to go on there. Their agreement has fell through, which means they're not going to be going on there either which is a win. So our first speaker is um, Kwana Chasing Horse, and she is from Alaska, and she's super cool, and she does a lot of um, land work and water work to protect the earth, um, and really just protecting try to protect our way of life. Um, so we don't really like to put any kind of activist titles on um, us because it's really just trying to cater to, or like trying to be Ongwehoe or indigenous to, um, to our lands. So Kwana, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Um, Shoji Kwana Chasing Horse, Oji Hanguchin in Lakota Sioux. Eagle Village, AK, well, Alaska, and Rosebud Reservation um, in South Dakota. I'm 18, and I'm the head chair of the Guichin Youth Council. Um, you know, I really like what you had to say, Makasha, about um, the activist word. For some reason, ever since I started doing this work, it's always been on my mind a lot, being labeled as an activist. And for me, it was more of um, just more of protecting my ways of life, protecting um, the future generations to come. It's all about the future generations and being able to keep living our ways of life without having to fear the dangers and the threats that come with it. So um, yeah, um, I'm 18, I just turned 18, so I'm able to vote this year. Um, since mm -hmm. I live in the United States, I would love to freaking vote this year. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. so as soon as I joined the Gwich'in Youth Council, which is very new, it's a new thing. It just started um, last year. It's actually coming up on um, one year of um, being a part of the Youth Council. And they asked me to be... Um, share my stories, to um, share my ways of life and educate those who don't really understand who we are as a people. And a lot of people don't even know about Alaska Natives. We're so far away from the rest of the world. We're way far up north and everyone's more down south. And I feel like um, a lot of our um, nations aren't getting enough 
I wouldn't say attention, but just getting enough media, you know, following um, what we're doing up here. So um, back maybe in September of last year, I got to go to Congress and I spoke on behalf of my Gwich'in people um, on a bill card called the HR 1146 bill. And it was passed in the House of Representatives and we're still waiting for it to get passed in the, um, in the Senate. So this bill was to protect our sacred lands. Um, our people called it the sacred place where life begins as Gwich'in people, um, the border in Canada um, in Alaska, it split our Gwich'in people. So there's a lot of, I have a lot of family in Canada as well as Alaska. Um, it's really hard for me to go see them. <laughs> and, you know, it's really hard for me to learn more when I want to learn more when half of my people are in Canada. Um, but, you know, we were called the caribou people. We followed the caribou and we always stayed um, away from the sacred place where life begins because we respected our caribou and we said, you know, this is a place we don't want to interfere with because it's the one and only place in Alaska that the caribou go to bird their calves. Um, not only that, but it's the only place they are safe to bird their calves. Um, we have a lot of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can kill a baby calf along with many other threats. So that is the one place that they go to and um, it's really sad to say, but a lot of our native corporations here in Alaska are funding some of the oil industries. And that's one thing that we have been fighting for a really long time. I am the fourth generation of women fighting for this cause. And um, me being in the Capitol, speaking with representatives, speaking with senators, meeting all these people was a really big thing for us because we have never gotten to use our voice the way we have wanted in the past. And finally, for many, many years of um, just fighting for this bill to protect our lands, it had been passed. Um, and that all ties into, you know, obviously the oil and gas industry, um, climate change, you know, Alaska is thawing twice the rate anywhere else in the world. Um, I see it every time I go hunting. Every year, the ground is softer. Areas are not frozen anymore when they were frozen for thousands of years. There's a lot of permafrost melting. And so a lot of the villages along the coast, like the Eskimo villages, the Inupiaq villages, they are all um, having to evacuate some of their own hometowns and from their ancestral lands because of climate change. Literally, their communities are collapsing into the ground due to climate change. And so that was my big thing too, was, um, you know, the oil and gas industry are a huge contributor to that. And we have the pipeline here in Alaska, and it's really hard for um, our native men to get jobs. Um, and that's one job they always turn to is the oil and gas industry because they offer a lot of money and they pay um the villages or the eskimos and the um Inupiaq a lot of money to be able to um drill in their lands and we think it's really really sad and that's one thing that we've been trying to um keep out of our lands is the whole um oil and gas industry so that's one thing that um, I've been really fighting for it, which ties into climate change and our way of life. But, you know, we're the man camps for, for these um, oil industries, when they have these man camps up, it puts a lot of Native women in danger in the surrounding communities. Um, it's really sad where they place these man camps, you know, just like how it is with environmental racism. They set them in places where, um, where it's really impactful on indigenous people along, especially our women. A lot of our women are victimized and including our land. Not only is it the land, but it's our bodies. So, they, um, yeah, they set them yeah. Around indigenous communities. They purposely set them around indigenous yeah. communities. 
they they don't want it anywhere else. They don't want it in. They don't want all that gas and oil. They don't want that around their own communities. They would rather have it, you know, there with those people. And it's it's really hard, um, you know, because I've had a lot of family members and have having horrid stories. And some of the, our native men would come back and not want to work for these companies and industries anymore because they see how how much it's affecting our earth they see it firsthand um one of my mom's friends came home and said we had a spill and they keep a lot of these spills secret they don't blast it anywhere so half the time we don't know if there's a spill because they keep it secret and um if one little hole one tiny hole is punctured in our pipeline it sprays hundreds of meters across our land and it completely destroys a whole area of our land, miles and miles of our land. So they, um, to keep those quiet, they hire more people to come in and clean it up when there's of course still residue from the horrible cleanup that they do. Um, it's, it's, it contaminates everything that touches yeah. from, from the water to the land and the insects. And the animals, everything, everything. And it's so sad because you can even smell it when you breathe it. It's toxic. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was in D.C. and I finally got the opportunity to use my voice, I took it. I was like, you know, we cannot have this anymore. And this is not who we are as a people. You know, a lot of people need more awareness of these issues. It's it's happening everywhere. Not only is it happening in Alaska, but it's happening all down in the lower 48, even in Canada. So, you know, I think it's really important for youth, especially these days to stay woke on what's happening because, um, you know, the more we know about it, the more we can do about it. The more we talk about it, the more change there is. So, yeah. yeah um, do you have any like direct ways of how climate change has impacted your um, way of life? So for us, we have been noticing a lot of bugs, a lot of animals we have never had up here before. Um, we've even mm -hmm. seen some wild cats like Krugers and stuff we've never seen up here before. And um, our caribou, you know, is our animal. We are caribou people and we are seeing ticks on caribou and we don't have ticks up here. We are seeing these insects that could kill and also, you know, our animals here, they adapt easier to the cold because it's normally freezing up here. Even during this time, it gets, starts cooling off. Um, and it's not like that anymore. Last, this last winter was the coolest winter we have had in many, many years. And that was one thing that I was really happy about and I think it was mainly because of COVID <laughs> um you know there wasn't as many flying not you know all the CO2 in the air it's not out it wasn't as bad as um the couple years in, before so that's one thing I'm grateful for is getting to have a cooler summer I mean winter not summer <laughs> but um yeah that's definitely you know, seeing climate change in my way of life is has a lot to do with the animals and the bugs because, um, you know, if a new bug comes up here and our animals aren't familiar with it, they can't adapt to it like that. It takes thousands and thousands of years for our animals to adapt to these climates, to these bugs, you know, any new change that happens, it takes thousands of years to adapt. So once they can't, they can't adapt that fast, they are just straight up harmed from it either kills them or it just hurts them or our um, meat and our fish we can't eat because they either have parasites they're infected they're sick or they're just dying so in climate change too I'm seeing in the water um, around some of our villages we're getting just straight up dead fish and usually we wait they make us wait so we have fish and game up here and they don't open up they only open up certain times and you have to have either certain nets or certain rifles you can shoot them with and it's really hard to stay um within like within the rules and regulations it's really hard for native people to keep living their ways of life like hunting and fishing because um you know we're not getting fish like we used to because they're dying because the water is too warm and they're getting heart attacks and just dying or we have new parasites in the water um and 
infected um, salmon were getting a lot of that. And, you know, once we, we usually would get, let's say 60 salmon a day, and now we only get like 10. Um, and once we pull them out, we could only, only eat like four of them because either the meat is bad or they're sick or they're already dead. And it's, it's really sad because it's affecting a lot of our people, a lot of our people um, in the rural villages way far out in Alaska, they can't, they don't have the money to come into town all the time. It's expensive to fly in and out of villages because um, it's on little bush planes. We, it's like $300 a ticket in and out and you can't always drive in and out of these villages. Some of them you can only reach by boat or by, um, by a plane. And so it's expensive to live out in the rural area because you don't have access to a store, you don't have access to a vehicle, and you don't have access to the city where you can provide for yourself, provide. But our people are really struggling right now because um, we depend on our way of life still, we depend on fishing still, we depend on hunting still. And when we're not able to do that the way we usually did before, it's really harmful and a lot of our people are really suffering, especially in the rural areas um, and especially our water too. We have glaciers, a ton of glaciers up here and they're all melting really, really fast, which is causing certain rivers to be extremely rapid and is draining out other rivers. So oh it's just a matter of time before certain rivers are completely dried up and other ones are just way too full. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> That's but we're working on that. Yeah. Uh, you say things because uh, in our way of life, we have these prophecies as, you know, what we've come to know them as. And a lot of them have to do with the land change and um, our different types of sustenance, like our food, water, and our animals. And what they had said is that things are going to change. You're going to start seeing less and less. And like what we've come to now realize is that they're biological indicators of climate change and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the people that come before us, you know, they were so amazingly, you know, like uh, in tune and inept with the environment that they were practically able to predict all of this that was going to happen because uh, they knew like the first, one of the first um, omens, like you said, bugs, right? They changed the landscape, which uh, for us was um, the honeybee because we have, um, I think, like seven or eight different types of uh, bees that are actually uh, native to around here. And so like when the honeybee comes, it actually changes the entire landscape like drastically. It'll change our, the different pollinators and the different types of medicines that used to grow here. And we always knew as a um, biological indicator that times are going to change and we're going to see a drastic change from our regular um, fauna and flora and we were going to lose a lot of that stuff so they, they actually re realized it was like a time of uh, sadness when they would see bees like that so it's pretty interesting that you say stuff like that because um through like all my um like studying and my research it's it's like exactly the same way like the way you're telling it is that that had happened to us a long time ago so uh mm -hmm. the really yeah uh, i understand that you know Yes. Do you want to um, tell us a little bit about the work that you are um, doing with the Gwetch the Gwetchen Youth Group? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, Gwetchen. <laughs> so um, for us, it's more of just uplifting youth voices. Um, and since me being head chair, you know, it's a lot. It's been a lot trickier getting things done due to COVID because now we're, they're banning travel in and out of the villages because a lot of our elders and our babies are getting sick. But right now um, and in the past, we have been traveling to places. Um, after I went to DC, I went with Michael Chin Youth Council and I went to um, New York. So they took me to New York because we had just you know, pass that bill to protect our lands, but it's not permanent protection. It's just for a certain amount of time and for, you know, how long or how much money they're willing to put in to keep going with the process of drilling. So, um, so they had me traveling a lot, speaking, 
and I went to New York and I had spoken to a lot of the um a lot of banks and financial institutes that were um financially supporting all of these um industries the oil and gas industry and so I would go in these meetings with the CEOs of these industries and have these conversations with them telling them why it's so important why we don't want them to fund these um, oil and gas industries so it took a while and you know there were a lot of them that were for it they were like no we're gonna drill like we're gonna support them but you know we'll hear what you have to say and after I had gone in there I would be surprised of like the mindsets of these um, people because you know you know for, what, for me being there I just it's me educating them because they don't know what it's like they don't live here they don't know our people and so me it's just really educating them trying to get them to understand why it's so important for us and why we are suffering because of the choices they are making um, you know to them it's just like whatever but it's a lot bigger for us and you know trying to get them to understand that was really hard so I went traveling to many different places um, I went to Denver on behalf of my Virginia Youth Council, but also um, personal work. So the North Face had, um, I would say, not really funded, but they support me and my mom in the work that we do. She works for Native Movement here in Fairbanks, Alaska, and she organizes and works with a lot of, um, like, let's say, grassroots organizations that um, help fund um, local Native um, we can say like Native artists or um, people that are trying to make a change. So Native Movement also um, was supporting me in this and they um, have been working really hard on the same issues. So the Gwich'in Steering Committee is what put together the Gwich'in Youth Council and Native Movement and the Gwich'in Steering Committee work closely together on these issues. And so um, I went to Denver and I got to speak at an OR. So it was an, for the outdoor industry. It's where all of the um, outdoor industry companies come together and they show all of the retailers and stuff, um, you know, their new products, like what the upcoming line is for whatever. Um, but for me, my job there was that the North Face was coming together um, and supporting a lot of indigenous people on um, uplifting their voices and sharing and educating people that don't know what's going on you know looking at a bigger picture so I got to go there and they had put together a whole panel surrounding me and my mom and they are now funding a short film um, on me and my mom uh, for the North Face so they um, took me there and I got to meet a lot of really cool people. I have been at and spoken at a lot of really different cool rallies. Um, and I think, you I'm know, glad I couldn't hear you what I'm you said. Yeah. I'm glad your work is completed. Yeah, right, so and that's you. the thing. It happened in such a short time. I was really surprised. You know, I was like, wow, people really care what I have to say. <laughs> and, um, you know, so the Patagonia too, as well, they have been supporting Gwich'in people for a long time and they were a big help with um, passing the bill. So, you know, having these supporters is really important, but I think, you know, what I'm really grateful for is just having a platform to use my voice. That's one thing that I'm really happy for is, because um, not a lot of our youth get the opportunity. And, um, you know, when a Native youth has the opportunity, you have to take it. There's not a lot of representation out there for us. And, um, you know, just being educated and staying woke and knowing what's going on and speaking up is what's like really important to me. So, yeah. Yeah, that's why I encourage youth in my community to use their voice because they'll be supported and you just have to have that passion keep going keep going keep going and um and people will notice and want to support you and that's what happened when i wanted to fight against nestle or like um i just had to keep my head up and just keep going and people will support you if your heart is in the right place so yeah. it's like up to 
it's definitely, I encourage youth to use their voice, definitely. Speaking of water rights and, um, and land rights, we and have climate change and, and climate change, biodiversity and human rights and human rights, all of the above. We have Nidhi and she's from the, um, the, the oh yeah, the Uni United Nations University, uh, which is located close to us. And she's on this water project and she's been such a huge help and to getting things going. And she does awesome work and she goes to different, she travels like the world and she's pretty fearless. Um, so here is Nidhi and she, you can introduce yourself a little bit and when the work you do. Thank you, Makasha, that was very kind of you. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, my name is Nidhi Nagabatla. I work for United Nations University. We are hosted with McMaster uh, around with the, as an arrangement with the Canadian government. And as an institute, we serve as a, unite, uh, a think tank on water for United Nations. So we produce knowledge. We also influence policies. We prepare um, documents for, for UN's work related to water and sustainable development goals. And we also invest a lot in youth through our different capacity building programs. And having said that, I'm so delighted to talk to you on this forum to share, exchange, to hear, and to learn, and also to sort of share. And let me start with two small quotes uh, that comes from our uh, message on water. When we talk about rights, when we talk about cultural connectivities, when we talk about having everyone um, a, a part and and uh, the planning to be inclusive, the policies to be inclusive. These quotes are water for all and leaving no one behind. So I'm going to explain some uh, narrative, some stories, some share some information around these two small advocacy quotes. I can also call it activism quotes because I think uh, there, there is no harm in being that activist who can lead the way. And maybe this word got tarnished, but I think uh, we have to re-question this world to become more substantial in driving sustainable development as we go along and youth have a lot, uh, a huge role to put it back in place. And we do need a lot of water activists. And I think maybe I am not uh, really counting myself as one, but I'm very, very happy to support whosoever is taking that lead role. And we have seen in the past meetings of the UN how how Greta Thunberg has taken the call on climate change on the world stage. She's been very bold. And I think she's taken the criticism phase on the face and, and she's kind of stood up to it and still holding the torch high on being that voice that we need, the youth voice. And I think so happy to hear more youth voices, especially from the indigenous side coming in and joining that, that whole scheme of things. Next slide, please. So as, uh, as we're getting into the next slide, let me uh, tell you something about uh, what has happened in the past years in, uh, in terms of uh, the notions around water, climate change. There have been a lot of water crisis situations that communities are facing. And water world is a big world. Some communities face some kind of situations. Some people are facing droughts, others are facing floods. Some are facing the, uh, the impact of climate extreme and water extreme events like tsunamis. Uh, hurricanes, um, landslides, water infrastructure, like uh, dams, sometimes they collapse, they cause destruction, and the whole notion of unsustainable development. So as we have climate change scenarios, which you may have heard, and it's not necessary to go into the science of it, but to understand what it means for you to contextualize it to your own understanding, to your own community, to how what you can make of it. Similarly, we at UN, we identified water crisis scenarios. If you feel that it can bring you some, it, you, can, you can align it with your work, please go through this report. There is a link that's been provided. It gives you at least some numbers or some trends worldwide that you can compare or you can derive from, or maybe you can use in your work. Next slide, please. And 
And uh, something which uh, I work on closely is the the human the human right. The the before slide, please. Well, ten years back, the UN put a resolution. Can we have the slide on the human rights before this? Uh, ten years back, now we're celebrating. After this, next year uh, in this 2020, we're celebrating ten years of human rights, which is the next next slide. Anyways, you can see that United Nations took an effort to recognize that every individual around the world should have accessible water, should have water available, and should have adequate water, good quality, enough quantity, and that is a right that should not be compromised. But when you hear the stories of water warnings, you hear water advisories, especially for indigenous communities in Canada, you feel that some of uh, much work has to be done to fulfill their human rights to water. And there are a number of barriers which we all understand, but I'm, I'm sure some of you can take those barriers as a call to take the water rights, the climate rights agenda to the forefront of policymakers. Especially, I really like the guest speaker from um, Atlanta talking to the policymakers at higher level, because somewhere that's where the chain needs to be made. Thinking needs to be developed. Knowledge needs to be communicated because people sitting there perhaps may not understand uh, the complexities and the challenges that people on the ground are bearing. So I think uh, this is another point to share. Take it as it fits in your own mandate. Next slide, please. Next slide is about the water security. So UN declared, the UN declared uh, a water decade from 2005 to 2015 and then came up with a water security framework that encapsulates not just supplying water, but to ensuring. And there was a framework in the previous slide. Uh, there is a different slide order, so maybe I'll try to align. Uh, you, can, you can see that framework and see that it also talks about having stability in the community, having involvement of the community, having good governance. So it's not just about water delivery. The slide after this, please. Has a, uh, it has a nice conceptual framework that talks about it. Now, at some point, you must have heard about Sustainable Development Goals. These were launched in 20, 2015 as an agenda for 15 years till 2030 to see that whatever was not done as a global community, let's join hands. Let, let us identify problems that communities are facing on ground, voices that were not heard before. They should also be sitting on global governance tables. And at that point, I might want to bring in um, Makasha to just say one or two words about her experience of uh, the meeting at uh, United Nations headquarters in New York, where, the, where she yeah. carried the message for the climate justice. Maybe some few words, Makasha. What was your experience yeah. there before I go further? Yeah, I think it definitely relates to what you're talking about, that we don't have our voices, our Indigenous voices um, at the big tables often. Like when I was in the United Nations or at the United Nations, for example, I was doing the opening for the United Nations, um, United Nations Environmental or United Nations Climate Change, um, Youth Climate, climate Change week. Summit, I believe, mm -hmm, Climate mm -hmm. Week, yeah. Um, so I did. I did the opening and in the opening, I did a pipe ceremony, which is on my father's side. And um, I said there about um, how we need to protect our waterways because they're more important than oil. Um, and we also need to pray about these things and as one mind and one heart. And that's why I did the pipe ceremony because it, and I said that it's not something to, um, to, to play around with. Like it's not a show, a pipe ceremony isn't a show. It's to really bring the minds and hearts together of all the people that in that room. And like when I was, when I did that, it was for the um, beginning of the climate change forum for the youth and it was the first one ever. And I, um, and at that one, at the event, I noticed that there was no, um, no indigenous voices representatives whatsoever. I was the only person in that room who was native. 
and and they had and it was a lack of access because after I got done talking, these youth, um, about seven of them had solutions to climate change and they didn't, um, none of the solutions um, could work in indigenous communities because one, we don't have basic human rights like water. Two, we don't have Wi-Fi and internet connection um, in a lot of the places. Um, three, we don't have the um, buildings or like the ex the technologies that was that they were talking about that you would need that cost millions of dollars. So any of the any of the solutions that they have put forth, all of them um, could not work in indigenous communities. And that's why it's important that indigenous voices have that we have a place to have our voices heard and and the people who were judging were um, Google and like all of these people. I'm not too sure like who all, but like they're very high, but they were also not like indigenous leaders like they should be. And, um, and to like be at the table along with everybody else. So like that was an eye-opening experience for me because people didn't even know who Mohawk people were. And that was like a strike to me because like this is that where New York is, is traditional Haudenosaunee um, Mohawk lands. And so that's why it was like super disconnected. And in the other room, like 10 steps in the other room, there was an indigenous, an indigenous climate change summit where there was only like maybe five senators or state members or whatever they're called and um, just like a handful of like indigenous people and, we, and it was very like structured. They only had a certain amount of time to speak and when the other room had like a, a room full. So like that was like the disconnection of indigenous voices around climate change and um, water sustainability and all of the solutions anything to do with climate change, I think, was very disconnected when I went. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think uh, UN is putting an increasingly large effort to see that indigenous voices are part of all important discussions, discussions on land management, discussions on land allocation, discussions on climate change adaptation planning, but uh, most of it is rather, rather in theory than in practice. So I think somewhere it has to be a sort of some small steps needs to be taken from both ends. And I see that uh, these are small steps that you have gone and represented, but they can go a long way in inspiring number of people, youth along around the world to be to and to encourage them to be to participate in such discussions to not fear to uh, to put a voice on the table to ensure that their agenda is represented. And I think it's going to go a long way in making the transformative change of sustainable development that we all are thinking. With that, maybe let me also share very, very quickly with you the World Water Development Report in 2019. Its, it's title was Leaving No One Behind. And there was a lot of interesting messages, messages on in, including youth in, uh, in not just in, uh, in kind of giving the messages, but also the part of the action, the action coming from the science, the action coming from on ground, on ground planning, the action coming from designing resilience plans, executing them, and then taking ownership. So a sort of a, a big focus on that. Why, why, was it give, uh, why was this emphasis given? Because there were some gruesome facts that came through the analysis. Look at one of these uh, message. World's most vulnerable and also most poor people pay more for getting water than rich. And this is, this is a really blaring fact. And there is a lot of data to support that. So uh, this, uh, this whole message this report brought to the high level policy makers was to see that future discussions on how water should be allocated, who's going to use the water, how they are going to use the water, should all be made fair and transparent and inclusive and participatory. Next slide, please. A very quick word on the newest report on, from 2020, the water, uh, World Water Development Report in the next slide. 
that focused on climate change and also took the whole agenda of water for all, exclusion, inequality, uh, to address them, to promote engagement and equity. And in, you'll, these are such, uh, just advocacy posters, but you'll see a, a specific poster was made for indigenous people. So they are represented in all discussions. And I see that uh, some steps have been taken by people from Africa, from Asia, New Zealand, Australia, even North America, Latin America. I do see them in meetings. I do meet uh, them in meetings. They are given a special session. They are given a voice, but we need to do more. That's just the beginning. Next slide, please. So you see here the water, uh, the indigenous people, water needs have been represented very clearly in the World Water Day celebrations worldwide. And they talk to all the people who, are, who have been ignored in the past and should be a voice of the future water security discussions. Uh, the new report, very quick words on that, and I will limit it to what it talks uh, about youth. The new report is uh, Water and Climate Change. It was launched on World Water Day 2020 on March 22nd, 2020. And it says that water resources management is an essential solution to managing climate change impacts. It also talks about how water and climate risks are connected to the human health, which is again an aspect that remains missing in climate change discourse, in water management planning discussions, diseases, deaths and injuries, and a focus on mental health. And I see Dawn and uh, uh, you have in their own way taken this agenda on the table. You're discussing this. So I really want to congratulate and compliment on the good work that's going in investigation, these interconnections. Very, uh, before I close, two statements that talks about youth. And I would like to really emphasize as I speak, youth can influence and participate directly in efforts to learn about, prevent, for, and cope with the impacts of climate change. And this, uh, this influence, this would, this would clearly influence how different interventions and planning measures related to climate change adaptation will work in future. Uh, also, this report, I, I would uh, uh, really suggest you to have a look. All the people working on youth issues was funded by the European Commission. And it, uh, it brought wonderful stories from around the world how youth are designing an action agenda on climate change mitigation and adaptation how they are coming up with this wonderful projects like the Youth Climate Lab. So these are some few snapshots from the work that's going on at the UN level. I can uh, definitely add more, but I would like to save uh, some time for getting some questions or maybe, maybe sort of getting into a discussion. Do you have any questions to ask me? Yeah, um, Kwana, uh, do you have any questions that you would like to ask Nidhi? Because right now, um, Akisha had to leave because he his phone was at 4%. So he had to leave a little bit early. But do you have any? Um, Not really. I think that was really straightforward, really um, factual. That's like one thing that's really hard to come by these days is people that are actually um, know what they're talking about um, and that was like when I was you know I was listening like as hard as I could my phone kept cutting out it, it's been glitching but um, I learned a lot actually um, and I don't have any questions I can think of right now but um, I just want to say thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and um, educating me more um, thank you for that. Thank you. And take a note of the Water Action Decade. It was launched in 2018, just two years now. And it has some more years to go, eight years. So become a part, start your own campaign, take a look at uh, what it entails in terms of mandate and objectives. Try to make a nice discourse about it. But also this nice report that was launched uh, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel for Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Biodiversity and ecosystems remain very important to the culture and identity of uh, indigenous people. 
not just in Latin America, but uh, in North America, Latin America, but in the Americas, but around the world. So this report has, uh, has shown that we are losing millions of species, animal species, plant species, as you were talking about uh, in, your, in your discourse early on. So we have to take a careful note. We're just not protecting ourselves. We also have to protect the nature that we live in, that we are a part of and that serves us. And I think uh, this report really emphasizes how this can't be done without involvement of indigenous people and their traditional knowledge. And I've shared that in the previous meetings with, uh, with, the, with the Onigonos project, and I would really like to again flag it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went so much for your knowledge. Um, I wish I was as smart as you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You're in the making. You're in the making. You have a fabulous mom. I'm really inspired by, by her. So we are in the chain. We are in the loop. We're going to pull off the chain. That's what we're going to do. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was, a, that, was, that was amazing. That was really good. And it's very, you know, like as Kwana had said, it's very um, inspiring and refreshing to actually see somebody who cares about um, like real human beings, you know, not just a, uh, a prophet, but cares about the future generations to come and cares about the world that uh, how we see it, you know, because when we talk about the world and about all these different natural elements and nature and stuff like that, we always refer to her as our mother or in familiar terms, you know, that's how we um, view a lot of our family too, like as distant relatives or extended family. That's uh, something that we've always held um, close to our chest. We've had, you know, great big families. You know, we are always um, are uh, worried about who's um, healthy and whatnot. We always worry about our cousins. We all grew up together, and that's how we see the world and the land and all the uh, animals and all the plants and the waters, especially. Uh, that's how we um, really relate to them as as our family. So. That's amazing to see that you're on the ground and oh, doing the that's work. That's wonderful. And I think there is always a space for alternative views. This is not a straight line de development and the visions of sustainable development. It has to encompass everyone whose interests are at stake. So I would like to compliment, yeah. keep, uh, keep going and keep doing what you're doing. It's very important. Do not even think for a second that uh, the, the voices uh, can be ignored. They, we have to find a place for all voices, for all age groups, for all societies, for all communities. And that's where the mission of United Nations stands, leaving no one behind. Danjo, everybody. My name is Erin Wise. I'm from the Hickory Apache Nation and Laguna Pueblo. Um, I come from Pawati Village. I am currently on Tiwa territory here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and I am the Communications and Digital Director for Seeding Sovereignty. Um, at this time, I'm also a co-director of the Indigenous Impact Community Care Initiative, which is basically um, our organization and collective's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. For me, it started because I was scared that my community, which has so few people, were going to get really ill and that no one was going to be there to help them. I was watching what was happening on the Navajo Nation um, with folks who were losing intergenerational families in singular households. Um, there were, you know, everyone from great grandma down to babies passing away. And we were having to deal um, with the lack of any sort of governmental support, any sort of um, state support, really. Um, a lot of folks, like y'all know, it's, it's easy to pretend that you don't see the indigenous peoples or people of the global majority. It's easy to not see black folks. Um, and so they decided to not see us. Um, and, you know, as the cases have gone up um, in New Mexico, Navajo Nation's actually been able to curb them slightly, not, not a lot, but they've been able to bring their numbers down. And there have been no new recent deaths. Um, on my reservation, however, we now account for over 60% of the cases um, that are in northern New Mexico in Rio Arriba County. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about how I think that these, um, you know, numbers being so high in communities of color, people of the global majority, indigenous folks, black folks, 
Um, I do believe that it's a continuation of the ongoing genocide that's been committed against people of the global majority here in the United States. Um, I feel like the lack of support that will likely um, not be there when it when it reaches First Nations, when it reaches, you know, communities in Canada, um, you know, that that y'all will understand because it happens with everyone, no matter what side of the medicine line you're on, that we're the we're the disposable ones. Um, so a lot of this work has centered on how can we provide water to communities whose water is being stolen from them by the Army Corps of Engineers who control the dams? How can we provide water to folks who are dealing with the carelessness of others like um, you know, the Navajo Nation in 2015? There was the Gold King mine spill where the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, actually unwittingly released hundreds of thousands of mine waste into the San Juan River and it actually turned the entire river orange. Um, and they didn't tell anyone on the Navajo Nation for over 24 hours to shut off their well intakes. And so people's wells were poisoned and their animals couldn't drink the water. And when they showed up um, to, you know, kind of do some damage control, they brought recycled oil tankards and they, they brought them to the people. And when the people filled their cups, you know, um, they saw that the oil separated from the water and the people said, you know, is this for us? And they said, no, 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 it's not for you. It's not for you. It's for the livestock. And they were like, well, we can't give this to our livestock either because they, they can't drink oil. And, um, yeah. you know, so finding ways to provide water in a place um, where water is fairly inaccessible for rural communities and also for urban indigenous communities, for unsheltered folks, um, you know, relatives that are living on the street. How, how are we, you know, providing access or at least um, looking at solutions is, has been some of the work that we've been trying to do with this next phase of our initiative. Our next speaker is um, Tina Nagata. And None other than she, Tina Nagata herself. Yeah, and she's from New Zealand. Um, she's going to be Zooming from New Zealand right now. So it's like, I don't know if it's super early or super late, but she's um, an indigenous human rights and environmental advocate who promotes indigenous conversations, conservation, conservations as best practice for global sustainability. Sustainable, sustainable future. Globally sustainable future. Uh, is, that, is that how you say it? Nagati Horu. Uh, is that how you, is that close there, Tina? Kura Tina, Kura Tina Koitou. Yeah, the NG is actually pronounced together like, like a N, uh, just like saying an N with a silent G, I guess, but like mm. how you say NG at the end of ring. Yeah, so Ngati Poro is the name of my people. Um, yeah, Tina Kurua. <laughs> it's great to have you here, Tina. Oh, uh, look, lovely to be here. And and Hemihi Tene Kia Koro Tira Kia Koito Tefano or Six Nations, uh, Hodna Shone Mohawk. Um, Hemihi Aruha Kia Koito, my Tene Mukupono Te Taira Fiti, no Reda Kohikurangi Te Maunga. Um, yeah, I thank you for for the invite to come and share some conversations, which are also a part of the best practice conservation and conversations. And our con and our conservation starts with conversations, right? That's how we do, in mm -hmm. um in our indigenous um, worlds and approaches. And so, um, yeah. Uh, just really thankful for the invite to come and spend some time with you. My name's Tina, Tina Ngata, and I um, live on the, my, my introduction before uh, introduced me through my mountain and through my river. And that's how we, that's our um, traditional way of introducing ourselves is by introducing our mountain and our river. Um, I live on the East Cape here. So you can see, we call the name of our, of our island is actually Te Ika Maui. The, the boring colonizers just call it the North Island, but that's quite um, incorrect to us because from our perspective, this map is upside down and we're actually, <laughs> uh, by those understandings, I guess the South Island, but the East Cape here is the tip of the fish. If you look at, if we can go back to the um, uh, view of the whole island, 
you can see it's actually a fish and the head of the fish is at the bottom of the north what you'd see is the bottom of the north island that's the head of the fish and the tail of the fish stretches up but and i'm on the east cape which is the the fin one of the the side fins of the fish and um and so my mountain's name is hikurangi uh, the tail that reaches up into the sky and um and my um, river is Waiapu, and my people are Ngāti Poro. And I, where I live, yeah, is exactly where that dot is on the East Cape, the further easternmost tip of of the um, of Te Ika Maui. Wow, that's that's awesome. I hope to come visit someday. I'm not one of the lucky people that got to go experience it, but hopefully I know it's Dexter. <laughs> we would love to have you, and we would love to have. We're always trying to scheme and plot and find ways to get Kasha and Dawn and Cody and, and we would love to have you come here and we would love to host you. So you can see we're a coastal people there and the, the forest and mountain estate um, that's just in land of me is called the Rokumara Estate. It's a 250,000 hectare native forest estate and it's the largest contiguous forest on our island. Wow. Um, and so we're, we're, but from our Amara covers all of that forestry estate going all the way inland and south. And it also covers a good amount of our marine estate. So the name of the Rokumara stretches from the, from the mountains all the way out to sea and into the basin. And we give it all the same name which is an interesting insight to how our ancestors really didn't differentiate between land and sea. It was all territory, you know, all one territory for our people. Mm. Wow, very interesting. Mm. Um, play the poem now. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that because we have also Turtle Island, which is shaped like a turtle. And it's interesting that like our places that we come from are shaped like what we respect I guess and what we live by yeah. and um yeah and we're also I'm Ganya Geha and that's people of the flint and um I'm uh Gayon Gwanka I said in um Anadaga language but Gayokono in uh, Cayuga language and Cayuga in English people language but that just means um basically people of the shirt basically like Beautiful. Really, well, I, no, Lovely. Not people, of the shirt, uh, people of the pipe or people of the pipe. And my grandfather told me that the word for pipe was a choktok. And that's how you said it in uh, Anadaga. And we had these big, long uh, pipes and it was carved from stone sometimes or uh, made from clay. And they carved their own uh, pipe, basically. Everybody had their own until we got the uh, trader pipes and stuff like that, which is made from that white clay and we had our very own special um, blend of tobacco and stuff like that too. Beautiful thank you yeah and well we are we're considered um so my people we come down from the whale the whale people the whale riders and so if we can go back to that map again that showed where I'm from um our ancestor Paikia came yep that one there are, Yep, that one. Our people, Paikia, um, our ancestor Paikia came from across the ocean on the back of a whale. And um, just near where that red dot is, you can, um, you, there's a little forest patch to the right of it, right by the coast. And just at the bottom of that is where, yeah, exactly there. Just where your cursor is now, exactly there, yeah. That's where he landed. Um, it's wow. a little place called Tepito. So he landed with his um, with the whale there, and he fell in love with a woman called Huturangi, and that's who our my research center is named after. Huturangi was the woman that that the whale rider fell in love with, and she had the mana the the um, she held the I guess authority over the lands, many of the lands around that area. Um, and and her parents were um, canoe voyagers as well who came from Hawaii or Hawaii mm -hmm. Ginui. Uh, but they were they have uh, been identified as coming back from Hawaii and so um, and so they um, 
came together on that spot and then from them on the in that area is where the people of the east cape of the east coast all descend from from that union and so the whales are um but that's a migratory route for our whales they come down along the eastern seaboard down to antarctica and then back up again towards tonga um they and we also have a number of cetaceous um mammals our um, dolphins as well our orcas that all migrate along that route and so um i think you know when um when you came to visit us kasha that was that was not long after we had been um defending our coastline from oil exploration vessels and seismic survey vessels uh and we did that through using our wakahorua our ocean voyaging canoes to go out and disrupt their um, surveying programs which are 250 nautical miles off the coast but those seismic surveys create terrible noise pollution and and they're really damaging for our um, ancestors and and um, cousins that still live under the water there so we went out to defend them and tell them that they weren't welcome that they were trespassing we we issued them trespass notices and cease and desist um, notices um, under under our law of the people of the Clyde Afeti. And, um, and we left, we beat them. They also, I wanna say, you know, shout out to our ancestors and cousins. We weren't acting alone there. We said our prayers and the sharks came and attacked their, their survey streamers <laughs> um, the day after we we prayed for them you know we did our our ancestral prayers for them to to go you know for the survey vessels to go away and then the sharks showed up and, and attacked the streamers and delayed them nice. for nine days while they had to go and get new streamers brought in from thailand and they gave us time to organize ourselves better to be able to disrupt their Team grids part. which we did yeah so we were really thankful to our um to our cousins that live under the water for what they did in that process as well <clears throat> and then we took the fight overseas to them at the united nations um because the oil company was majority owned by um <clears throat> by a norwegian company um oh, sorry by the norwegian government and so we went to speak to the norwegian government about their commitments that they made under the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the International Labour Organization Conventions, <clears throat> which secure Indigenous rights to our food systems and our sacred practices. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that was the meeting that we were at when you came to support us, um, Kasha, the, the um, inaugural Ocean Summit. Um, and, and we just wanted to talk about the rights of, of indigenous ocean peoples because our, our Pacific Ocean, the Moana, the Moana Nui Akua, we call it, is, is our territory, is, is Moana people's ter shared territory. So, um, yeah, we, we was always remember your support in those spaces. Um, it was really meaningful to us, yeah, for us. That is amazing. Awesome information. Yeah, Nyawe. And I think that is really... Let it uh, like leads us into our your poem that you want to share with us sure yeah so I'll, I'll let you play it and then we can speak to it um afterwards it's called i am hine i am wana I am Fenua. I am Moana. Between my thighs is life. I have birthed lands and gods and generations of ancestors. 
I birth change. I birth growth. Between my thighs is death. I am the last whale before your longest night. I am the cold embrace. I am the final word. I am Hine. With my voice, I open channels beyond the veil. I welcome the unseen and shift the space between us. I am Hine. I pull the tides within you. I command hordes. I bring war. from these breasts, which your book of men's rules bade I cover. Well, just remember, your aging grey hairs came from where? Know this, I was always here. These clicking tongues erased my names, even as they dictated their own demise. So don't you come along and think you save me. Recognize your life depends upon me. Understand your future lies within me. Realize that your fate rests with me, I am Hine, I am Fenua, I am Moana. Wow, that video is so powerful. I got goosebumps. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we go. <laughs> yeah. So um that's um that poem was a part of our um our virtual digital ocean, virtual reality um exhibition. Uh, which was a number of activists and advocates um, who put together artworks of poetry and performance and uh, and um, visual pieces as well and animated pieces for an online experience for people to engage with issues to do with the well-being of the ocean and our perspectives of the well-being of the ocean as well as climate issues um, as well from, from our traditional perspectives. Um, and, and that really is a poem that speaks to, um, you know, the fact that our perspective is that the ocean is an ancestor and that because we can, we can genealogically count our, our ancestors all the way back to when, to our ancestor ocean, we have the names and we enshrine the names of our genealogies in our um, lullabies and in our oratory and in our stories. So we remember all the names of our ancestors going all the way back to the ocean, who's also our ancestor. And we have sayings like, you know, the ocean is in our blood and we, we cry and sweat salt water to remember that the ocean is in our blood. And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of always, we're always reminding ourselves that we are the ocean and the ocean is our first ancestor that before there was land, there was just ocean. 
just the ocean and the sky and mm. that the first you know that's also where love began because love the greatest act of love is to create life and so um, that's where the creation of life started inside the ocean and so she's the home of love as well as the home of life and she's and she's in us so we are her we just like we're all of our ancestors we are her as well mm-hmm. and so the poem is really a reminder of that sacred creative energy and potential that comes through the ocean and then comes through us as the descendants of the ocean as ocean peoples and but also reminds us all of you know how powerful she is not just that the ocean needs saving but actually we need saving and that the ocean is incredibly powerful and can teach us lessons as well and so we must always be humble and humble ourselves in relation to nature in general in relation to the climate in relation to the planet and certainly in relation to the ocean because she's the source of life she can also be the source of death and um in a loving way that you know she will she will do what needs to be done for the sake of all of her children the human ones and the others as well Mm -hmm. and so um you know there's aspects of you know reminders that we need to humble ourselves when we talk about trying to save her (laughs) or be saviors around her um and and just all of the different ways in which that sacredness comes through in our ceremonies, the way that our voice can open channels to bring ancestors through to sit next to us in our gatherings. Um, yeah. And the females have the power to do that in our in our traditions and the way in which the female voice can be used to to call people together, to meet, to see justice, to seek justice um and and the and you know of course there's as well the mothering potential that we have the way in which we continue to be the portal for life to come into this world and also the the powers that we have to help people transition into the next world when their time here is in this form is done as well um and even though colonizers have come along and tried to erase the names of, I'm wearing a shirt that has all of the names of our sacred mother ancestors all the way up, you know, the goddesses. And the colonizer can try to erase those names, but mm-hmm. it's so important for us to speak those names. Yeah. Um, yeah, continue to speak those names and speak of our strength and speak mm-hmm. of our sacredness as well. Um yeah, so it's it's all of those it's all of those things that poem. Yeah, I think that we can definitely relate in our culture too because when Sky Woman falls, she the world is covered by water, and um, she's pregnant herself. So yeah. a lot of like life bringing to the ocean, and it's the ocean animals that helped her have build land so that she can survive on a turtle's back that is now grown into turtle island today um so yeah we have definitely a similar story with the ocean and the beginning of time um but we had a question that um popped up on our um our live our facebook live and um one of our viewers wanted to ask what oil oil company company did you chase out so we, we've had, uh, we've chased off uh, five, we've chased off five oil companies from our coastline now. That particular one that we, that we were talking about earlier, that was um, Statoil and Chevron who had a partner, who had partnered up for oil exploration along the Eastern seaboard. Um, Statoil is the one that's majority owned by the Norwegian government. Um, but they're now called Equinor. And, um, and so what happened there was, you know, that when they do their surveying, their seismic surveying, they have to collect their data in a grid. And so we used the, um, our, our vessel to 
position ourselves in front of them so that they could not complete their grid <laughs> um, and to just can and every time they had to turn around they lost that plot of the grid that part of the grid and it would cost them a hundred thousand dollars a day to turn around and and take their huge vessel largest seismic survey vessel in the world back again and try to start again and so um because they sell that information in grid plots and so it in the end it just became too expensive for them on top of the brand assaulting and brand shaming that we were doing it just became too expensive for them to keep on doing it but mm -hmm. also like i said before you know our relations and um under the water were helping us and then we also had a hurricane um, a cyclone start up in the south and make its way towards us which um which was helpful and because they're our boats our traditional vessels we can handle high winds and and everything we surf along on the surface they're big industrial colonial vessels they had to leave because they can't handle high winds and so we turned around and used the winds from the cyclone to get home swiftly and they had to turn around and leave and then um they didn't come back and then they surrendered their permit so um so they left and we were able to do that so that was those two and then the other ones were um uh, tag oil and adaco and petrobras were the three other oil companies which which we've chased off since uh 2010 um those yeah those are the the main oil companies on the eastern seaboard and then we have other oil companies elsewhere in New Zealand, but um, OMV, uh, Noble, yeah. But those are the main ones for our territory. Nice. That's awesome. And so you yeah. had like different elements helping you. Yeah. Oil, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oil companies and which, I mean, it's really important to tell that because I think people need to realize that our ancestors are right there and they can hear us and um, whenever we call they can help and they don't realize just how powerful you know the natural world is you know we come from the natural world and in one little false swoop they could take us all out because uh, that's the way we've always talked about here is that uh, you think you're powerful until you see something that's 10 times more powerful than you are, especially that big boat to be flipped over in the water, just that big mm -hmm. oil tank or whatever it is. Yeah. So, so that was ease. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely very humbling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, you feel when you're out of the ocean, like, especially on our traditional vessels, you feel the, the awe of our ancestors, of our ancestor ocean, there's nothing like standing in the middle of the elements with the wind and the yeah. and the waves and the water and, and everything all around you to feel that you have those ancestor elements right up in your face and it's really humbling. Um, there's no doubt who actually who has the actual power in that space. And the other thing that we did though is that we did a, a haka. Um, we which is like a, people call it a war dance, but it's, it's, I mean, that's only one reflection of one type of haka, but it's also can be a celebration and it's an honoring as well. And so we, we did a haka, which was um, with our youth. It was largely a youth, you know, we, the people who were on board the waka with us were like as young as 15 and um, the average age I think was 21. I was one of the elders <laughs> um, mm -hmm. on the on the on the waka, and and then the captain as well, and then the rest were, were relatively quite young, um, and I was so proud of them. And so when we did the haka, it was to that it was to the vessel, but it was also um, to our ancestors under the water and our and our relations under the water, and and the. The takahi, the stamp of your of our foot on the deck of our vessel, of our canoe, you know, that was us sending messages down to them to let them know we haven't forgotten our responsibilities, we haven't forgotten our obligations, we haven't forgotten our connections to you, and we're here and we'll do everything we can to protect you 
every single stamp was communicating to them that we were still there for them. And, uh, and that was a deeply profound um, and moving moment for us to be able to tell them in the ways that our ancestors would have, that we were still there for them as well. Really powerful um, act to take out for them because it's not just about us and the colonizer, it's about us and our ancestors and our commitments to them. I guess, do you have like any advice to our audience who is um, watching and wants a better environment or who is worried um, about our environment right now? Because our, our audience is majority young people. And so a lot of young people down in, here in Six Nations have demonstrated that they are very worried. So do you have any kind of words of wisdom or words of hope, either from like our stories or um, from your life experience? Um, well, you know, in Haudenosaunee ways, um, the simplicity of it is to just always have gratitude. And that's what the whole Ohonda Galiwadekwa is all about. Um, it's just on a daily practice to acknowledge creation and and for us to not forget her and I think that's really important and I think one of the other things is to look at women leaders like Tina who are leading the charge in her and, and Pua Case in Hawaii and um, Leonor Tenney down in Guatemala and many other women who are stepping to the forefront not trying to um um, self agenda or to, um, you know, um, making their own call to fame, but who are truly invested in the um, protection of our Yukitni uh, Stan Huja, our Mother Earth. And they're the ones that are doing the science, they're the ones that are doing the lobbying, uh, they're the ones who are um, calling the people together to stand. Uh, in the front lines to hold back the um, invasion of our um, precious Mother Earth. And, you know, this is a jewel of a planet and there's so much to live for. And so for me, it's like, you know, the philosophy of less means more is something that the younger generation should embrace and not do like what our generation did, where we live in access and we're frivolous and to move away from plastic and to move away from fossil fuels and to um, go back to the way that our not too long ago, less than 50 years ago, the way that our uh, grandparents and our own parents and myself used to live. And that's in small, simple gardens and small food sheds and, you know, taking from the land only what we need and to, um, stand in protection of her and um, to constantly every full moon to pray to the water um, for the water to be part of every ceremony that we um, practice. So and you know it's not that difficult to um, embrace ritual around and not take for granted those things that sustain us each and every day. So these young people have um, a gift, which is your youth and your strength. And you in your own generation needs to own, you need to own the responsibility of what's coming towards you. And so, you know, learn from us uh, what we did right and what we did wrong. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you're going to have to own it and clear a path for yourself. And, you know, don't repeat what we did but take the lessons that um, we've set forward. And, you know, if there's an injustice somewhere, then, you know, make it your life commitment to right the wrongs and uh, to hold close, to hold very close, <clears throat> you kidney style would you? Because she's all we have. And, you know, we're beginning to see a transition and a trend in societies all the way around the world where women are stepping up to leadership 
And, you know, we need to be in partnership with our men and with our men leaders in Haudenosaunee practice and to not be afraid to uh, lend a voice to the injustice and not to be afraid to lend voice to what we need to do collectively as a people to make sure and ensure that um, the future generation, seven, seven um, uh, copies down the line that they still have something to be nurtured and nourished from from the land. So it's a real important job. And I think as indigenous people and from our creation story, it was put forward that indigenous people would be in charge of the land and we're her original uh, stewards. And we should take that job quite seriously. So, you know, not to go on forever, but you know, you got these young people are doing a, a, a really great job, Nyaweha and Gunalukwa uh, and keep up the good work and uh, Make some babies, Makasha. <laughs> yes. It's important to um, put the right voices and right knowledge in the forefront. And, and the scientists that we have accumulated through four different research grants um, are amazing. Um, they've been doing really good work for the community. Um, and I I have to give a shout out to them because uh, this is really new for them. It's new for us. And that, that means that we'll probably make a few mistakes here or there. So um, it sounds good indigenous knowledge leading, but the system itself is a hierarchy which doesn't work well with our people. So we're just trying to bring our ancient knowledge into a modern concept. And when Tina talked about um taking their ancient laws and that's always been my question when i would listen to the great law when uh, jake was recited many years ago and i was trying to figure out how do we how do we apply that now um to improve our our environment and our people um justice issues so i think it's it's something that we're still trying to figure out. So some of the research that we've done um, together, I was just gonna share a small piece of it, um, is looking at how we uh, can take science and move it forward uh, in a Haudenosaunee framework. And women, um, every team that we have, including the, the grant that Louise was on and she is on all our grants um, are led by women and, and that wasn't, a conscious thing it just happened that way um so i don't know if the powerpoint is can play or if you can show um, some of the research we've done to discuss um how had no show any women's roles and environment um really go back to the the sky world and louise and i were talking about this uh earlier today um the teachings that when she fell, a lot of the knowledge is in the sky world. Um, the earth grasper, one of the first tasks given to sky woman was to, to get water. And, and so water plays a prominent role. Um, and it's embedded in our constitution, um, the great law. So I think, you know, the 50 clan families that Makasha was talking about earlier. Um, I mean, that design is, is mind-blowing that there's not a single thing within the great law or in our constitution that you need to tweak or change children had rights women had rights the environment um, we had responsibilities so i think bringing those um, laws forward to apply them to right now today how are we managing our environment here at six nations what role uh, and responsibility do we have so it's good to know the stories, but it, you really need to know how to apply it. And I think that's what women are exceptional at. Um, one of the projects we did was we brought back some of the Hewitt collection um, and Hewitt was one of the first ethnologists. Um, and he, he transcribed everything in Onondaga 
uh, Mohawk, um, some Seneca. And I brought back, uh, I took the faith keepers up to the Smithsonian and they pulled what they thought was important. And then we had some of our, our um, if you could go back one, we had some of our best minds um, translate. And so I knew the translation, for example, I think a lot of our people know who, who Fenton is. Um, he's not a nice person, but he also didn't translate properly. So a lot of the translations even that he did were wrong. And then those end up being books and we're stuck with what he said and they're wrong. So the way we did translation is we had many people translate and then each word would go through a vetting system of other local language speakers. And one of the things um, I wanted uh, translated was, was the woman chief. And the way that they translated this, again, this went through not just one or two people, but many people. Um, it, it clearly states under the, the great law that women are the stewards of the land. Um, and they called you know the females chieftainship. So it was very similar linguistically um, to the power that they held, but that it was a uterine law. And, and, and that's again, going to the fact that we're matrilineal, but it's illegal under the great law. It's legally binding that we are responsible to uphold uh, our responsibilities to the land for the future generations. So um, having this translated was really important because I know a lot of our people know this but I think reinforced, you know, um, some people who may have speculated that no women don't have power. So if you go to the next um, slide, I think that that the um, the the law of the woman chief um, that it was actually Gibson um, who who they interviewed for this um, talks about her burden that she carries and how her eldest warrior um, is one to assist her. So <clears throat> there is a lot of fuss about that word warrior, but it, it is exactly the way that it, it was uh, said in the language, it translated into warrior. And, and implicit in that is that protection of. So it's literally in the great law, uh, the constitution of our people, that it is a women's responsibility to uphold that and sustain um, the protection over time of those lands. So if we go to the next slide, we, um, we then look at um, how we might, how colonial intellectual legacies has undermined uh, clan mothers right from the beginning. Um, and Louise and I have talked about this quite a bit um, her role um, was seen as a threat, uh, especially to Benjamin Franklin, um, who ended up writing the quote um, about how uh, Iroquois men um, cling to the, the strings of their mother's apron. Like they, because often it was the clan mothers that wouldn't align or go to war with uh, colonial regimes. And, and so they really set out a campaign uh, to undermine women, much like you see the Trump administration doing, um, trying to undermine uh, uh, women. So it, a couple hundred years, uh, if you don't speak the language and you've only been exposed to what the West has written about not just our people, but any indigenous people, then you, you probably have a, 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 a perverted idea about the way our laws operate and the role of women. And that has impacted our people um, as well through residential school. So if you go to the next slide. Um, a study came out when we were at the UN, uh, Tina helped us <laughs> get into the UN. Louise and I would have been stuck on the outside. Um, so she bailed us, uh, got us in. But one of the studies that was being talked about at the Indigenous Peoples Permanent Forum had come out um, uh, through this intergovernment panel of 145 scientists from 50 countries. These are not people that have anything to do with Indigenous people. They're simply scientists doing uh, ecosystem assessment globally uh, in their regions that they're familiar with. And, and 
all in all, I think we all know that we're in trouble um, as a as a race, a human race, and and we can't sustain this level of pollution and consumption, um, and including here at Six Nations, um, including the Grand River, it's it's everywhere. But one of the things that they they did find, um, besides it being unsustainable is they found that if you go to the next slide, um, wherever um, indigenous people, and this is important, wherever indigenous people controlled their environment, and, and I mean controlled, so not like where we are fighting to have Canada uphold our treaties and stop stealing our land essentially, or taking over our river, um, taking our water, whether it's Nestle or any other company, we don't control those. Um, and, and, and we need to reassert our control. Um, and one of the things that can be said scientifically is if indigenous people control their environment, um, they'll, the environment does better. And that's a scientific study that took years uh, to undertake. So what their conclusion was wherever Indigenous people manage and control their environment, um, the environment uh, was not even uh, or, or very less severe uh, um, impacted by, by humans. So the ecosystem was doing well at end result. And that was the one finding that they came out with. And so when people say, well, what can I do? How can I help? How can we stop climate change? Uh, it's fairly simple, um, regardless of what group you belong to. If you return the lands back to the management and control of the rightful heirs under the Canadian law or American law, Maori law, um, that then you're actually, you're actually upscaling the opportunity that climate change can be um, less severe. Um, so land back, while it is a, a movement, um, it's based on science, both indigenous and Western, if you return the lands. But I would say, and this is important, if the indigenous people that you're considering returning land back to, um, whether you're a private owner, a corporation, a, a church, however uh, you're operating, you need to make sure it's, it's traditional in its uh, governance um, and that women are in positions of power because some of the newer um, Indian Act uh, leadership, which is very male um, and has been uh, male for some time, that since they were created by the government, um, tend to go along with Western values and, and ideologies, um, which means, you know, you have development. So I think, um, I think, you know, it's good to say give the land back, but but do uh, due diligence in that it's traditionally governed. Uh, group is, is in power and that women are in essentially still have authority and decision making, um, which has been removed in so many communities across North America, diminished, almost completely excluded. And, and it's not just Haudenosaunee that had women um, in those positions. It, it was Cree, it was Anishinaabe, um, Sioux. Uh, women had a, a strong uh, leadership and, and it just played out differently in different cultures. But where you see that diminished, and as an anthropologist um, traveled uh, far and wide, it's pretty evident, in, in fact, in some studies that have been done uh, called cultural continuity, like which communities, instead of looking at who, who's committing suicide, we, they looked at who's doing well in the, in, the, in the country. And one of the findings was, guess what? If women are in positions of power, control, decision making, um, that seemed to be a, a what they call a protective factor of well-being. Um, so Six Nations, I think, is is uh, well suited to be uh, reclaiming those lands and managing them. But we really need to um, pay attention to the gender uh, roles in those communities. And just uh, uh, if 
go to the last slide. Um, if you look worldwide, no, that's like, go forward. <laughs> um, if, if you look worldwide, what's happening with COVID, which countries did exceptionally well were, were run by women. And that's because women tend to care significantly about, about their children and grandchildren um, in ways that men, not saying they're better than, but they tend to manage um, the affairs, the domestic, particularly affairs of their people quite well. So if we could restore that balance, I think that is our responsibility. And Makasha taking on Nestle, you know, um, I want to thank you, Tina, for mentoring her and Bev, um, her going to the Confederacy. Uh, she was getting upset that people didn't seem to care at Six Nation that this, I mean, the only way to talk about it is breast milk. It's, it's breast milk, water made specifically for human beings. It, it's the best water on the planet and it's under the ground and it's being completely wiped out. And, and if you see what's happening in California right now, uh, Nestle and many other companies drain their aquifers where the land actually sinks and now you see it's on fire. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to take care of those things that you can't always see. And I think she was about ready to give up because she, she couldn't get anybody interested because it's something they can't see. Um, and, and it was your, your support that kind of re-inspired her, reignited her to go back to the Confederacy and ask one more time, you know, would you support this? And, and they did. So I wanna thank you for, for, it's so important, Louise, as well, the help that you give our young people, because it's unfair what we've done to them, what we're leaving them and what thoughts they have about their future. I couldn't even imagine at 20 thinking that. So, you know, supporting young people is what is, is most important if we wanna have a future. But I don't know if you wanna say a few words about that cease and desist because Nestle packed up and left. And I think her going to the UN at the Youth Climate Summit and, and calling them out in her opening prayer um, again, those things matter, but maybe you could just say a few words about that pretty interesting legal um, suggestion you gave her. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and, you know, um, Makasha is already, you know, so remarkable and inspirational for us as well. And that's in no small part due to um, the people who have raised her and the values that have been um, that that she's been surrounded with um, as well. I really want to acknowledge that you know that those who have supported her and raised her with those values, um, because you know the people like Makasha. Sorry to talk about you like you're not there, Makasha. You are. There, people like Makasha don't just happen. Um, they they come from a. a deliberate process of being raised with fantastic values and people around them. Um, the, the idea, you know, for us, when, when Makasha was telling us about what she was, um, you know, the movement that she was um, carrying, the, the, our groundwater is so important, you know, that's our most ancient water. The, the really ancient water. And in that poem that I spoke about before, those are ancient underneath Antarctica those are the sounds that you hear in those ancient spaces and it's the same with the sounds that you hear in the aquifers as well when we've put microphones into those aquifers it's an ancient sound that and so it's so important for us to protect that's where hine you know our ancient creative potential of water uh, who manifests in many modern ways, but she's still present in her ancientness in those places, in the underground reservoirs, in the groundwater systems, and underneath the ice caps. And so um, it's so vital that we protect those waters as the home of our ancient spaces of Hine. So do you want to talk Aww. a little bit about your virtual reality? is so beautiful. Yeah, Inspired thank you. I think, you know, I 
it's the stories, the stories that are that that you know, Mana Moana wouldn't be anything without amazing stories. And and I know that, you know, coming together with your guys' work as well. Um, and I hope we do get a chance to, you know, bring our stories together that again, what we'll see will be some amazing stories. Um and so we're we're able to leverage off that with with technology, thankfully. And Manamwana was actually a project that started a couple of years ago. A group of artists, activists, and ad advocates who wanted to tell our stories, but also our perspectives of issues like climate change and what's happening to our oceans and what's happening to our freshwater systems as well. The talent using our tools, um, our storytelling means our art, our oratory, our music, our poetry as well. And so um, Manamwana, because all of those things, you know, even the way in which we understand knowledge these days through colonial systems separates knowledge into all of these different disciplines that were created by Greek philosophers. Um, and, and so you wind up with these real silos of thoughts where science is separate to art is separate to all of these things but our ways of learning and knowing and being all of these things are enmeshed together so that our oratory is science-based our art is science and maths based um and so we we you know in honoring that truth we wanted to give voice to our science and our knowing and um through through our art forms and and that's why we we put together Manamwana. it's traditionally um oh well in, in its first iteration it was a uh, public art um event where we projected our voices and our um artworks onto a water screen a screen of a spray a screen of a spray of water in the lagoon with loudspeakers speaking. And we're going to be doing that again in November with these artworks. But with COVID, we needed to find another way to give voice to um, these artworks. So, so we developed our virtual reality exhibition, our digital ocean, which is um, what you see. So it's on, if you, you can go to it, it's online and live now, which is uh, manamwana.com. Yeah, manamwana.com. Um, or Manam, there you go down the bottom there digitalocean.manamwana.co.nz will also get you there but I think you can just go there also through manamwana.com um, and uh, we even have ceremony in there so before you can go in there you have to listen to one of our females um, singing a, an incantation kind of prayer karakia pao, um, to open up that space for you to go through the portal um, which is one of those carved images there is the portal to enter into the site. And then all of the artworks exist over um, as projections over the ocean. Um, and yeah, if you go through them all, they're, they're all very deeply profound um, communications around, there's the portal, we call it the Stargate. <laughs> um, and so after you listen to her, uh, go through her, what we call a pal. Uh, then you're able to enter through the Stargate. And then that's a form of ceremony for us um, as well. And then and then you, once you go through there, then you have a whole uh, series of um, artworks that you can interact with, uh, to which include dance, yeah, as I said, and poetry, um, or meditations, guided meditations as well, that embed these really deeply political voices as well. Wow, amazing. And that's all in virtual reality. So you're like experiencing it. You just can't really touch it yet. I wish yeah. I had goggles on right now yeah. to see. You can actually, there are a couple of VR goggle pieces in there as well. So there's two pieces that are filmed using virtual reality um, technology so that you can use goggles and be immersed, completely immersed in the artwork. Um, or you can have a look around. Some of them have been 3D scanned, so you can circulate your way around the artwork in a 3D sense as well. So there's multiple ones. Our one is like that you're looking at. I am Hine Moana is more just you know watching it play out in front of you, like you're in front of a film being projected over the ocean. But then other ones are 
virtual reality piece uh, goggle pieces that where you're inside you can look around and every the artwork plays out around you um even behind you and so um yeah, there's different different artworks that you can interact with in different ways wow. um, as well. And so... I can't wait to go. Yeah, that one is Mana Moana Meditation, which is um, about remembering the role of water inside of ourselves and the relationship of water to air as well, which is particularly important when we're talking about climate issues, the role of our ocean as the lungs of the planet alongside our trees, but the ocean is also the lungs of the planet that absorbs carbon and has a such an important process in relation to climate change. And that's also happening inside our bodies because, you know, the it's the waters of our bodies that carries that that oxygenizes our blood. Water plays such an important role in oxygenizing our blood as well. So that's what carries the air through and oxygen through our system and gives life um, to our organs and to our bodies as well. So Manamwana meditation is an artwork that will, it's an open-eyed meditation that uses the, our artworks and our stories to remind us of the role of water inside our bodies um, at the same time as that role of water to help us honor the role of water in relation to the planet and the air around the planet. Yeah. Yeah, wait for that. So this is just some of the footage. Ours is um, ours is a little I, I, uh, different, but I'd I'd like a piece like we want. I Louise is going to be the voice of the water, and it, it, we're going to have it in Mohawk. Kiyuka and in English, so it, it'll be um, shown in those three different languages. And we'll also do the VR, but also the computer. So part of it is is just the Grand River and um, uh, what it was like prior to contact. And then uh, we're traveling um, the water, the, the river is going to be speaking before all of this, setting up the role of water. And then the, the science part is testing the water, how clean was the water prior to European um, settlement. And obviously um, what, what little data there is will be including that. And then obviously as you travel to contemporary times, things change. Um, and then the third series will be um, uh, climate change What's preparedness. Surgeon? <laughs> if you're wondering what that is the, st the sturgeon yeah he goes right through the canoe and that's to, that's the i mean it's it's a experience it's a dream state experience it's not meant to be um literal like your your senses are what we're uh, addressing here um and this was done by mohawk students Uh, Mom, we can't hear you. I think your speak speaker went wow. out. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're talking. Yeah. So we're just, um, you know, we went to Guyana State, and they um, helped us out, and we did a lot of research to, you know, this will be dressed like a, a an ancient longhouse with our traditional foods. So this is just a sample. Um, we have to wait for class to get back. COVID obviously interrupted uh, where we were at and we'll start again in the fall um, virtually. So we we want them to fully understand Haudenosaunee before they get into the science and into contemporary issues of our water. Um, Grand River, as you may know, um, was one of the dirtiest in, in, in North America. Um, and it's been slowly coming back thanks to the Grand River Conservation Authority, but Six Nations stretch is particularly bad. <laughs> and, you know, I think you talked with Charles about environmental racism and, and the fact that they dredged uh, the river here quite deeply so that a lot of the pollutants stay along the reserve. Um, so we'll be addressing that as well in the VR. Um, we also then go to the um, Knowledge Center 
this is where we have, you know, wampum belts, treaties, um, as well as checking the water, um, teaching people how to use uh, water monitoring equipment. It's not that hard. And the app that they're developing, you'll be able to download it. Anybody can download the app. So you can see what's in your water in real time. Um, the sensors are, are being made by the engineers. Uh, we're also installing sensors on people's tap water. Um, just try to make science accessible to everybody, but also our, our, our science, the traditional ecological knowledge that uh, Six Nations has um, shared so far with the project. I don't know if there's sound with this or not, like we took the sound out because we didn't really work on sound. Is it working or no? It's a go soon. Okay, is it working or no? Uh, I can't really hear no sound from there, no. Oh, that's too bad. So yeah, they're speaking in the language and they go over the different wampums. We've got Jock doing turtle teachings. Um, but since T Tina has to go, uh, maybe we can just stop it there and say the Knowledge Center will have both the Western findings and it'll have uh, Haudenosaunee knowledge um, from Wapum belts to roles and responsibilities of citizens. Um, people think treaty people are just native, but like we made treaties, our ancestors made treaties with your ancestors, right? So you're treaty people too. You have roles and responsibilities to uphold and it shouldn't just fall on um, indigenous young people to carry that burden or women. Um, we need all the allies that we can get. Um, if we're gonna clean our river up, decommission those dams, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring the health back um, of our, our waters. And I think, you know, Makasha learned when the Wellington Water Watchers, um, Council of Canadians all stepped up to help her. You know, she wouldn't have been able to do a lot uh, of the things she did without that help. So allies, Roger, we need you, right? I just yeah, there isn't one person that doesn't have a role. No. There's not one person that doesn't have a role. Every single person has a role and a responsibility in this, um, in this voyage, yeah. It just happens to be women that need to tell them to get moving and will help you but you need to get moving to, to uh, not only learn what's in your tap water, like some of the findings that we totally did not expect at Six Nations, this is in people's tap water, not their wells, but in, in their tap water coming from their wells was arsenic, uh, mercury, um, chromium, aluminum, things that I, we just thought it was farming runoff, phosphorus, bacteria, and we weren't even gonna test for those things. But listening to the community, they pushed us to test for heavy metals. You can't, you can't clean that out of your tap water. So it is something the next three years is gonna be finding solutions to, to clean up the problem.